Hi, everyone. I'm Marissa Saul, and I am the chair of the USC Young Alumni Council. Um, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. I know it's a Friday night. Um, if you're located in LA or Southern California, you also know there's not that much else to do. So we thank you so much for joining us this evening for capitalizing on your career. Um, when everything started this year, we really wanted to focus on programming that would help our young alums throughout this difficult year and really pivot to using Zoom life to our advantage and bring together panelists from across the nation, reach young alums from all across the nation and put together as much programming as possible while we could um, all come together virtually. So we're really excited for our panelists this evening. And the idea behind this event was to bring together some industry experts from different fields to have an open and honest discussion about how to make the most of this time and how you can use our virtual world and 2020 to really capitalize on the opportunities that are presented, whether it's um, career progression or making a shift in your career. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Brianna on our programming team of the USC Young Alumni Council. Um, actually, really quick, just if you aren't familiar with the SC Young Alumni Council, it is for any young alum of the University aged 35 or under. Um, and if you are older than 35, that's okay too. We definitely welcome everyone and are so excited for you to join us. Um, but we put together social and professional events throughout the year. So definitely check us out on social media if um, you're interested in other things that we do. So without further ado, Brianna. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name is Brianna Wallace. I am the professional programming liaison for Young Alumni Council, and I am super excited to be diving into our event today. As Marissa mentioned, we wanted to make sure that we provided programming that helps us navigate this very unique and turbulent time and gives the tools to make sure that we are, like this event says, capitalizing on our careers right now. So I am joined by three amazing panelists across several different industries, and we'll just discuss the insight and look at how things have changed over this year and how to catapult ourselves into success going into 2021. So I'll open it up to introductions for each of these lovely panelists. I'm joined by Justin Gaynor, who's the founding partner at Gaynor Law Group, Crystal Ryu, who's the senior director of procurement at Postmates, and Kim Chastang Lee, who's formerly with Gap Inc. So each of you feel free to introduce yourself, let us know what you studied when you were in USC, as well as what you're doing now in your roles. I'm happy to start. So, um, so when SC many moons ago, so my major was business, of course, when I was in school. Um, as Brianna mentioned, I'm formerly with Gap Inc. I am actually in the uh, process of transitioning to uh, a new company and a new industry. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I'll be starting uh, virtually uh, in January, my new role. But uh, I am going to continue to be a senior director within the strategic sourcing procurement. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with the uh, area. So happy to be here. Chris, do you want to hop next? Yeah, I can go next. Um, I just missed the cutoff for the definition of young alumni, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still here in spirit, in heart. Um, when I was at SC, I actually was pre-law. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I actually changed my mind senior year, first semester, and it, uh, it was like a total, you know, about 180 about face. And um, I ended Smart up. Smart move, Crystal. I, Smart move. No, no, no offense, Justin. It was just for me, it was not the right move. <laughs> and so I ended up pivoting really last minute into um, also into procurement um, and have been in the profession ever since. I'm the, currently the senior director of procurement at Postmates, uh, which just got purchased by Uber as of December 1st. So I guess I should say I'm an Uber employee now, but Postmates, I'm sticking with Postmates. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, 
Awesome for you guys showing up on a Friday evening. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, Justin Gaynor, I run a boutique transactional law firm. Uh, we've got lawyers in Texas, California, and New York. Uh, we focus on transactions only for the most part, buying and selling businesses, buying and selling commercial real estate or other outside general counsel services for, for companies for the most part. Um, I was actively involved with Marshall for a long time. I look longingly back on my years as a young alum and as a student. Uh, I hope to live vicariously through all of you. Uh, and I, I look forward very much to helping any way that I can and, and, and giving back because USC um, did a lot uh, for me and my family. So uh, excited to be here and be a part of this. Amazing. Thank you all. So we're going to jump right into questions. I will say that if at any time you have a question or comment, feel free to please enter in the chat. We'll go through a moderated section, but we will have a portion at the end for dedicated Q&A. And then of course, if anything is pertinent as I go through, I'll make sure to throw it in. So first up, we've seen a lot of different shifts, accelerations and trends over the past almost nine, 10 months. But I'm curious to hear what you all think has been the most unique or surprising shift you've seen taking place in the professional world over the past several months. And feel free, Kim, if you want to start it off. I'm, I'm happy to uh, just share. So what I've seen, which is uh, really interesting, and I think it all depends on maybe the industry that you're in, is just a willingness for a lot of companies to now have more remote workers, right? That concept of you don't have to be exactly where headquarters is, be based out of that location. You've seen companies really, one, because they've had to because of the pandemic, but I think, two, they're starting to really kind of revisit and rethink where do I need to hire my talent? So this kind of opens things up and you're seeing uh, corporate companies really just reaching out saying, where can I get the best talent? And that doesn't always have to be kind of tethered or tethered to, to the headquarters location. So I, I'm seeing a huge shift of a lot of companies and industries uh, looking at that. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, look, I feel like everything's changed in various degrees for various industries, right? Some industries are in places like LA shut down still, right? Or again, um, other industries have kind of pivoted, uh, you know, pivoted slightly. Other industries are taking off, you know, online retail, for example, right? So I feel like it's, it's an industry specific question a little bit, um, but the 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 biggest the, the biggest thing that I've seen happen is companies be willing to change period right like this whole idea of this this concept that Kim was talking about of we can hire somebody who sits their butt in Japan but is really great for this role and they don't have to come to Los Angeles every day is kind of I think given leaders at different companies and different industries, this idea of, well, what else? <laughs> what else have we done for the last hundred years that we don't have to do? And, and what can we do differently? And frankly, I feel like that's an amazing opportunity for, for current students and young alum to have their, you know, their take on the way the world can work heard uh, and to add value uh, to whatever industry they're, they're in. Amazing. So the next question, uh, specifically for maybe our soon to be or very recent grads and our young alums, how can they best navigate the fluctuations we're seeing across industries, including the impact to large corporations? Maybe Crystal, you can start this one off. I think um, to Justin's earlier point, there are industries that have very clear headwinds and very clear tailwinds right now. Uh, make it easy on yourself. Pick an industry that's booming, that's doing really well. Those companies are hiring like gangbusters. DoorDash is a great example, right? I mean, I joined food delivery during this time for a reason uh, because it was experiencing incredible explosive growth. Um, also just 
had a unique opportunity. Like Kim said, I started actually recently in August. I started fully remotely as well. And um, I wanted to move back to LA. I, I was living in Oakland. I didn't want to stay there long-term. Postmates is based out of San Francisco. I didn't say it during the interview process, but when I, once I got an offer, it was part of the negotiation, right? Uh, in terms of, and by the way, I'm relocating to LA permanently. And once you're at that stage, if they want you, they'll figure it out, right? So um, it hasn't been all bad. And so I think part of it is you want to target an industry that's really inundated with opportunity right now and, and needs to flex. Um, and even like the targets and the Walmarts of the world, they're doing so well. And they all also own smaller companies. Uh, for example, Target owns a company called Derm Store. They're in El Segundo, right? They're doing really well. Walmart actually has a totally different part of their company. Walmart.com operates totally separate from Walmart. So it's like, it's not like you have to go to Bentonville, Arkansas, just to work for Walmart. Um, so I would say focus on the clear category winners right now. Thank you. So for the next thing, I both all three of you have touched on, right? What it looks like to maybe look at how we're working remotely and what tips you have for anyone transitioning or approaching companies that are still hiring during this time, but have maybe a completely virtual recruiting process. How can they set themselves apart? That's maybe different from that typical in-person interaction they would normally get. I don't know that the interview process for me personally was that different just because it was remote, um, mm -hmm. to be honest, because even in past jobs that I've interviewed for, there's always some of it that's still by video conference because not everyone sits in one office. Um, and so I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that, to be honest. Um, it's, it's kind of going to be, you know, the same sort of like preparation of making sure you just have a good quiet space, having your questions ready, having good questions ready, um, being really open and flexible to the fact that the person on the other end also may have kids running around, dogs barking. Like it's actually better and easier to make a more personal connection. Just, I think, because everyone is in a personal space right now. So, uh, I, I actually, I, I wouldn't psych yourself out too much about the actual interview process being remote. Uh, I would agree with Crystal on that one. Um, I, I've just recently gone through this process um, where everything was virtual, but I don't know that it was so significantly different than the experience I have and where it's a combination. It, some was virtual, some was in person, but I think what you do in order to prepare yourself for any type of uh, job interview are the same things you should do when you're, when you're doing it remotely or virtually. I, 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 <clears throat> I, I think what I'm learning about this pandemic, we always, you're always going to kind of keep hearing this this concept of the the new normal. That it's it's what it is, and and if you're going into corporate America, um, I would tell you, you really have to be prepared for constant changes and big sweeping changes sometimes. So don't get stuck in like, oh my God, this is so different. How do I prepare? What are the tips? What would you do in 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 any scenario in order to really prepare yourself? or a job interview, make sure you're doing those same things. And uh, to Crystal's point, it, it, it is nice though, that you're in your own space. It does make it a little bit more, um, maybe less formal sometimes because you do, you know, I, my last role, I, it, it, you know, I spoke with 10, 11 different people through, during my interview process. There were some where there were kids floating in and out. It, it, it didn't even phase me because it's just, this is just how things are now, right? We're all kind of operating in our own personal space. And so you just kind of move forward and what's the objective? What am I trying to accomplish? And so I think be prepared as you would, whether it's in person or remote, it, it, do the same things that you, you would normally do. Um, uh, I, I don't know that I would kind of make this distinction between whether it's in person or remote. I, I would just add the focus, uh, go back to basics, right? Like, even though they might have their kids running around, make sure you scheduled quiet time with your family in a room that looks as professional as possible. So when they envision you working for the company, they envision you in a productive, quiet space 
where you're actually going to do valuable work for them, right? Don't forget about, you know, researching the person. Don't forget to wear something that is business appropriate just because everyone's wearing sweatshirts on Zoom right now, right? Like don't don't let the ease of what COVID has added to us change how much you want to knock this interview out of the park. Send a handwritten thank you card. Go the extra mile to ask whoever's setting up your interviews where you can send that so the person will actually receive it. They may not want to give you their personal address, but like don't send it to some corporate office where no one checks the mail for nine months either. You know what I mean? You want to get credit for it. So I think really walking through the details and not skipping steps because I mean, look, Zoom culture is a skipping step steps culture, right? It's it's a if I can wear a T-shirt, then I can wear a sweatshirt, then maybe I can wear shorts, and you know maybe I don't have to brush my hair. Like there's a slippery slope there sometimes when you're already with the company, but when you're interviewing, like if you've got a quarantine beard, shave it. If your hair hasn't been cut in nine months, think about having someone else cut it. You know what I mean? Like do the little things. Thank you. Those are great tips. We have one, and this kind of builds off of that specifically um, for primarily for you, Kim, since you will be starting in a new role shortly, do you have any top, any tips for starting a new job remotely? Well, I haven't started yet, but what I will tell you is that in my prior role at Gap, I was had responsibility for team center of excellence team, and so that team was essentially responsible for setting the processes, uh, determining the technology that the sourcing or the procurement team would utilize. And one of those uh, areas was an onboarding process. And part of that onboarding process that we really leaned into was just as we were bringing on new people into the organization, how can we make sure the things that come naturally when you're doing things in person, hey, go to this meeting or have a touch base in person with this meeting to meet all these folks. We had to just really set those up remotely. So um, I'm going to do a lot of the things that I put into this program that we'd set up at Gap which is setting up touch bases, not just with the people within your teams, but people outside of your teams. So business partners or people in other functional groups so that you begin to, you're able to kind of navigate and understand, especially with uh, supporting functions that maybe you're not in it, but you know that you're gonna be working with these teams. Just have in, in you know, just uh, what we call just kind of touch base or when I was at Gap, we called it touch bases. So these are just informal connections. How are you? What are you doing? If you have ERG programs, so uh, these are programs, whether it's for LGBTQ, African-American, whatever it is, joining those groups really helps you to kind of broaden your perspective I think it's so easy when you're working in a remote environment to only kind of connect with the people within your immediate team. You have to make a concerted effort to kind of reach above and beyond that in order to really make those connections and really for you to begin to understand the culture, right? So the culture of an organization is all those unwritten, unspoken things that you just feel and see when you're in a company where if you're not going in and you're working remote, how do you gain that if you're not doing that in person? You're going to have to make efforts. So do things, um, you know, for example, Gap, I, I would do things like they had cooking courses. And so I, it was one ERG group and another year and we joined together and I met more people in the company that I hadn't met actually when we were in person. So these were people I, I was able to connect to, finding things that we had uh, in common because typically companies will have a lot of programs or things. And if they don't, why don't you think about starting something, whether it's a book club or something where you can kind of reach out and start meeting other people within your organization. So I think you're just going to have to kind of own that and really uh, make a, a point to reach out to folks that are not just, not just about a business connection, but just about, Hey, I, I'm trying to kind of meet other people within the company. What do you do? So forth and so on. So. Kim, I just want to piggyback off of that because I think that's awesome. I mean, the other thought that I'd have, and if you guys disagree, let me know, but shock some people and just call them, right? Like there's so much communication via text and email and setting up a video call. Like if you're jumping into a new role and you don't know anyone and you want to get to know someone, like 
then you know what I mean? You can just call someone and talk to them for five minutes. And A, I think they'll be surprised because it seems like no one does that anymore. And B, I think you'll be able to have kind of a non on the record conversation and really get to know someone even in, in five quick minutes saying, Hey, I just called to introduce myself, say hi, and, and, you know, get a couple minutes with you. And a good way to open that door up uh, because I'm, I'm also putting on my hat, you know, so a lot of times you're in a role where you have a lot of things that you're doing. You're like, okay, do I need this? But just say, look, I just want to spend, you know, 15 minutes and find out who you are and what you do. I, I, I'd like to learn a little bit more because people a lot of times like to talk about what they do in a company and, what, you know, how they fit in. So make it about, hey, I just want to spend 15 minutes. I'm, I'm new to the company. I'm new to the organization. Would you mind just uh, allowing some time where I can have an opportunity to understand you and what you do within the company? It really helps me understand more about the, the company and the culture. People are usually very open uh, to that versus they feel like if you just call them like, okay, well, what do you want? Do you want something? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yes very good we have a lot of great questions coming in from the audience so i'm going to take two more and then we'll move on um one this is for you justin elaborating on a point you made earlier do you see the use of virtual backgrounds during interviews part of that zoom at ease slippery slope would you recommend their use or should we avoid them entirely and opt for our real bedroom or living room backgrounds I think I think I think the Zoom backgrounds are great, especially when you don't have a great option. You know, some people are like, you know, in a basement with not a great background. Right. And that's their quiet place. So, yes. But again, pick the professional one, perhaps, and not the blowing palm trees on the beach. Right. Like pick something that's appropriate to whomever your audience is. And, you know, a, a, there, there's plenty of easy ones out there. There's, you know, if you're interviewing with someone who's a Trojan, there's plenty of easy black and or red just you know standard backgrounds that you can use so I, I think that I think they're fine great um, for all which industries are sticking to brick and mortar or professional attire or culture versus those that are say business casual or casual um, can you be specific for what's professional what's business casual what's casual so your viewpoint on what maybe comes off that way especially for those that are transitioning and may have not been in a space where they've seen, right. A, a lot of business professional. I'll, I'll, I'll start real quick. Look, if I mean, I'm, I'm a Marshall guy. And if we're talking about corporate America, my instinct is still, if, if we're talking about interviews, like put on a suit and unless there's a clear reason not to, but if we're at, if we're being asked about like, <laughs> what is the culture now? I mean, I, uh, I've got bankers <laughs> and everyone in the finance space and the merger and acquisition space. And if, I, if I'm wearing a t-shirt, I'm sometimes dressed more than they are. Uh, so I, I think that there's been a dramatic acceptance of non-professional attire across even the most professional uh, industries from, from my perspective. I don't think that changes what you should wear if you're trying to impress people or interview them. Right. Thank you. I would also say just also personally from coming from a company that has hired a few people here and there, and then we'll go on to hire a few more into 2021, just read the room first. Right. And as you're on a segment of, you know, our back-to-back -back video calls, see what people are wearing, start more professional and then work your way down. But I would say always stay personally. I always stay a little bit more elevated than those who are around me because it will set you apart. And perhaps let's say you have a meeting where someone from leadership is intended in attendance. They're going to notice that even if it's what different from what they normally see with all their employees, because you're setting an impression when you first enter. I would agree with you, Brianna. I always say start off professional and then you can always kind of pair back. But in general, just coming from a company that was all about fashion, I get, I mean, Gap owned Old Navy, Banana Republic, and Gap, Gap brands. No surprise uh, <laughs> which brands were doing <laughs> better than the other, right? The more casual brands because people are working at home. So they're just... You just don't see, uh, you know, this huge uh, 
people still wearing suits and things like that a lot. They, you, 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 at least working in that company, you just didn't even see it in the numbers. So, but I think you always, if you're just unsure, start out more professional and then look at everyone else. I mean, you see everyone else is casual, you can kind of fit in. But again, I think those are things you'll, whether you're remote or in person, you would do the same type of thing, right? You know, I, I my first day at Gap, I was way overdressed. And then I saw everyone, I mean, completely overdressed. <laughs> and then I saw everyone with sweatshirts and khakis and jeans. And I was like, okay, I gotta get it. I gotta get with this. So, you know, it's, it's no different remote, right? <laughs> Awesome. All right. Thank you. Keep throwing in questions and we'll make sure to get to some more later. So what are your perspectives on taking a job that isn't exactly what someone may want for the sake of having something or making money or to wait for something more aligned with their career goals? Um, I'll, I'll take this one. I'll start off. I mean, as someone who took her first job, not knowing at all what she wanted anymore, um, I can say that was a very good choice for me because sometimes um, what's really hard when you're coming, you know, fresh out of college or you'll, you have limited experience under your belt is it's just as important to know what you don't like as what you like. And sometimes what you think you want, you have built up expectations in your head that are all wrong. I mean, my career trajectory, I always thought I have to work at a big company. I want this big brand name corporate experience. That was my goal, right? And so the first several years of my career, that's like all I focused on. It was really myopic. And then it was wrong. And since then, I've gone smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm now going the opposite direction. And I'll probably go even smaller still. And so that took me a few years to understand. So I would just say, it's great that you have a sense of what you want, but the universe has a wicked sense of humor. It may, it may also show you that it's not what you thought it was. Um, and, and that first job I took at Hilton Hotels as a buyer, you know, it showed me, okay, I actually really like this work, but I don't like doing it for this company or this type of category. So that's really good insight. And then you take that and you move on, right? Great. So thinking more on the connection level, um, we've seen a lot of virtual events like this one. Um, how would you encourage people to get involved and stay connected during this time? And like as in networking with new people or connecting within the companies they're at? I would say both on um, the professional sphere and that can look like within the company or maybe within the industry that they're in. So I'll jump, I'll jump in on that. Um, and I just, I want to make sure I answer the question towards the right audience, right? Is the idea that are, are we focused on a particular goal, like getting a job here, or are we just talking about like the Trojan family and networking generally? Networking in general. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I feel like there's, I feel like there's two really good opening statements for Trojans reaching out to other Trojans, right? One of them you get for only a short period of time, which is like, hi, my name is blank and I'm a current student, right? That's like most alum kind of want to respond to your question or help you out. Right. And the other is, you know, hi, uh, I'm a Trojan alum and, something nice about the person you're reaching out to, right? Like I want to be like you when I grow up type of statement, right? So if you're trying to network with people who you are looking at, like if you're like searching LinkedIn to find people to talk to and you're, you're, you're just being honest about, Hey, I would like to take 15 minutes of your time and you don't have to ask them to go to coffee anymore because you can't see anyone in person, right? Like, I'd like to take 15 minutes of your time because I'd like to talk about your career path because I'd like to be in your shoes in five years, 10 years, 15 years. And I'd like to see any advice you have, right? That's like really hard to say no to as an alum because it's like, man, you're flattering me in the first sentence and you only want 15 minutes. And, you know, the reality is, we're all sitting around for longer periods of time than we have been before. So sure. I definitely want to help you. So 
I think you just in, be intentional about what you want to do and, and make sure that you don't like forget about it during these crazy times. Right. I think the networking is even more important now. I think the people are, are, are you know, the people who you want to network with are, are, are probably more sensitive to whatever situation you're in and they want to help more than ever too. So I, I encourage you to do it and just be intentional about it. Amazing. Anyone else have anything to add? Great. Um, so in thinking about networking as well, and in some spheres such as happy hours or social, social professional mixers, what is your advice or best practices that you've seen for approaching virtual networking while still remaining authentic and engaging? I'm just going to say, I, you know, I, I think over as I, I listen to the questions, my biggest advice would be don't overthink this. Um, don't overthink, um, you know, whether it's in person or virtual. So I've done a ton of happy hours, cooking classes, all of these things virtually. Um, I've been invited to uh I participate in a weekly wine session that I found out about now through a former coworker. These are all great ways to just connect with people and just stay connected. So what are you doing just in your own personal life would be my question to just kind of maintain as, you know, especially here in California where there's been a lot of just quarantining. So you have to, you're just kind of reaching out to stay connected with people it's really no different. I think professionally too, there's going to be, you know, depending on it's a company or just some type of networking group you're part of, having those mixtures are great. It's just a great way to stay connected to people. There's so many different groups. I mean, I, I think in the past two weeks, this has probably been like the fourth event that I have. So there's always tons of opportunities. It's just how do you ensure that you are making those connections and you're, you know, you're ensuring that you network? It's a little bit more challenging sometimes, right? Because Zoom, because you can't have multiple people talking at the same time, right? It's that, that sometimes get a, gets a little odd. But I think just kind of participating and when you're hearing someone speak, if they say something that's interesting, how do you maybe connect with them outside of that kind of big, massive group and, and follow up with them? So I, you know, I would just say don't, don't overthink the fact that because we're remote, this is going to be something that is so challenging and so hard. It's just different. So just a different medium. And I'll, I'll jump in and say, you know, look, maybe the tables are turned a little bit, right? Like certain people by their personality type love walking into a room with a hundred people and mixing it up and having six cocktails and getting a hundred business cards. Right. And then for every one of those people, there's someone who hates that. Right. So if you hate that, congratulations. Right. Boom. Here's your time to shine. Like, you know, digital, virtual. Right. Like embrace who you are and, and, and how you like to do things and and, you know, take advantage of what is a shift in the traditional networking intercompany get together. Right. And, and, and make it productive for you. You know, and if you are the guy, the guy or gal who loves that hundred person room and you can't get it like, you know what I mean? Do something that puts you in your element, invite five people to whatever, a poker game, virtual, you know, something that fits who you are so that you can do, you know, where you, where you shine. Cause I think more than anything, this change should be looked at as, as an opportunity instead of just a challenge. And I think it is an opportunity for people to do things differently and, and have more positive results than, than if you were just stuck in the traditional way of doing things. Um, I'll jump in on a couple of things that have been helpful as I was trying to network within Postmates and also try to meet people. Again, kind of can be a natural sometimes. Two things I found really effective is uh, Kim had a great point. I did the same thing where I, my goal was for the first month, I met two new people a day. It was all my calendar. I was going through a list. I want to meet two new people a day. Each person I met, I would ask them, what is your favorite Slack channel at this company? 
um, because there will be some sort of communication medium your company uses. I got all sorts of weird, crazy, good recommendations. I found out there's a channel just to talk about your puppies. There's a channel that's just to talk about our competitors. There's a channel just to talk about uh, financial markets. I mean, whatever, right? But the point is you start to get tuned into these subcultures within your company. And then the second thing that was a really good forum for networking is um, because everything is virtual, uh, the trainings that are happening at any companies right now. So I did like an unconscious bias training and a managerial training. You really, really connect with everyone else on a training way more than you would actually in person because everyone's super distracted in person. Everyone's like, you know, looking at other things, jumping in and out of the training. And so um, also has been surprisingly a good way for, for me to meet totally random cross-sectional people I wouldn't come across in my normal job. And then there's like a natural in if I want to follow up with them afterward, like, hey, I really liked your contribution or what you said about the, 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 you know, would love to like, just get to know you. Amazing. I'm going to take some of those tips as well, because it's very easy to just get lost in the back-to-back meetings, Zoom, Teams, Google Hangout fatigue. So this is a good reminder to focus on that connection. So I'm going to go into our last question before opening it up to the audience, but would you have any different advice or more nuanced advice for anyone looking to establish mentorship relationships and how they can navigate one building upon existing or fostering new relationships? Here's what I'll say. I have quite a few mentees. Some have uh, prior companies that I've worked for have a purpose and an intention. So what is it that you're looking to seek out of this mentoring relationship? Sometimes I've had people say, I'd like for you to be my mentor and literally have set up time and they're looking at me and I'm looking at them and they're looking for me to kind of drive the conversation to start. You need to have a purpose. What is it that you're looking for? So are you looking to just check a box and say, yes, I have a mentor and she's in this role? Or are you really looking to kind of help guide a career path or explore uh, some challenges that you're facing and you just want to be able to kind of, hey, you know, I have this challenge. Here's what's going on. What do you think? You know, have a purpose. Go into your mentorship with a purpose and an objective of what you'd like to get out of that partnership. Those have been the best mentee, mentor partnerships and relationships that I have. And those are ones where I continue to this day. I mean, I may not even be working with the company, but I'll continue. But I, I, I really shy away when someone's coming in and it, either they're just looking for me to, I, I don't know what it is. They're looking at me and it has to be something that you're driving. You have a purpose. You have an objective of what you like to accomplish and just talk to your mentor about that. That should be your imp- your way of having an informal discussion about whatever's going on. And it should be a safe space if it's someone that's mentoring. you. So. Thank you, Kim. Justin, did you have something to pop in? I'd like to maybe just say one item that's unrelated to your question before we jump into the audience questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I, I think that the changes that we're facing here are a humongous opportunity, especially for young people right now. So I just want to paint the positive picture that underlies some of this, if I can, right? Whether it's big company work that you're looking for or not, like, I, I strongly believe what I'm seeing is the decision makers and companies are still finding their way into the office, you know, and I, USC, we can't give anyone advice to put themselves in a position where it's risky, right? But if you are comfortable, for example, finding someone who's an entrepreneur and, and wanting to work with them eat remotely or not, but it, you know, if you wanted to be in the office, if you wanted to volunteer, if you had, if you're looking for a job and you said, look, I can work for you for free, or I can help you on a project for free or something like that, you know, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities out there for people to be creative and to, to build their own path through this, right? Because even big companies, they're trying to figure out, like, are we hiring on our normal schedule? No, did we have to, you know, did we have to let some people go? But now we're busy again and we need to hire off schedule, right? Like 
everything that's changing, I think, provides a really interesting opportunity for young people with comfortability in this virtual world to begin with and, and, and creativity on how to sneak their way into exactly the role that they might want to be in or the company that they want to work for or an industry that they want to work for. Right. And, and it's because most of the rules that you would normally have to follow to do that have kind of been broken uh, in the last few months. Right. So I just want to encourage like the people I think who are going to succeed the most here are the ones who look at this as an opportunity to do something special, to do something different and to not follow the traditional path. I think not following the traditional path right now will be the way that a lot of people do get their jobs. Amazing. Thank you, Justin. So diving into the Q&A. So this first question, more and more companies are announcing expanded work from home plans long after the pandemic is over. Do you see the pivot to remote work being helpful or harmful for company culture in the long term? Well, I, I would hope, um, I think it will be helpful in access to talent beyond, like I said, a location where it's tethered to a headquarters location. Um, but I do think there are some benefits in having kind of that in-person engagement. Um, but I think you're just going to see a combination where, you know, you're still going to have a lot of, you know, I, I'm torn. My, my last role, I had my, I had a team in the U S and then I had a team, team members who were in China, who were in Mexico and, and Europe, you know, and, and UK. So you know, for me, for the teams that were international, this whole remote concept for them, they were like, well, that's the only way that we know Kim. We've always kind of talked. I mean, I, I didn't see them on a regular basis in person. So it was the U.S. teams that it was so drastically different. I, I, I would love to see more of a combination where you do have some in-person because there are just some things that I think meeting in person, um, uh, you just can't get always uh by seeing someone remotely, you can't have those same types of connections, but I, I wouldn't be surprised a lot of companies are gonna start really leaning into, look, I want to have the best talent to do whatever the role is. And that talent may not always be exactly in person. And so there might be more travel involved in where you make those connections you know, frequently to, to meet in person. But I, I think there are a lot of companies are really, I think Justin hit it when he's talked about just, companies are really observing and having an opportunity to see the benefits now. It's not, you know, especially large companies who've been around for a long time and maybe done things more traditionally have now really started looking and saying, maybe there's another way to do this and to still kind of get the best value of what I need to get out of, you know, my talent. And I think it's a, having an openness and a willingness to not have everyone just sitting at a desk or sitting in within a headquarters location. So. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so for you all personally, how do you structure your day to keep up productivity and creativity, but also balance a healthy mentality when you're living in your workspace? It's a good one. <laughs> Different for everyone. I'll just say that routine is more important for me than it's ever been. You know, I mean, the, the, my, my routine has always been that I'm an early morning person, you know, and there was definitely a point in time where the whole day blurred a little bit when this, you know, working from home, I've got a three year old and a five month old. So the idea of kind of living in your workspace was challenging, um, you know, I, and, and about two weeks in, I just, I, I just decided that I'm going to the office to work. And I think you've got to make whatever decisions you can, whatever decisions that you have at your disposal, like if that's an option for you to go into an office space and still be safe versus trying to work at home with a three-year-old and a five-month-old, right? Um, but routine, you know what I mean? Like the idea that things aren't the same, cool, but like do, do, so, do something in the morning every day, eat lunch, <laughs> you know, around the same time so you can get that little bit of a break, 
whatever the route, if you need to get out of your space in order to be happy, take three 30 minute walks a day, but do it as much as you can at the same time, like schedule it on your calendar. Don't let people put unscheduled zooms during the, you know what I mean? You need to have a, a sense of structure. I think, um, I think each person's structure will be different, but I think you got to put like a beginning, middle and end to your day together, even though you're in the same place all day long. I would completely agree with Justin. And I think, uh, especially when it came to lunch, I, I will tell you when I first started working remote, I would just breeze through lunch. What I notice is when I'm working in an office, you know, I would see people with food or smell it or something. So that would be my trigger. Oh, let me go get some food. Well, it wasn't happening like that. And so then I look up and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's six o'clock. I haven't eaten anything. How does that work? You know, so I think you have to just force yourself into a routine. And you know, what's been nice is that when you have those 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 challenges, sometimes I would just be, had a day, it was tough and I couldn't think through something. I would just block my calendar and go take a walk or go do something different that would just get my mind away from the work so I can clear my head and then come back and be effective. I think you have to do that. Just take those mental breaks and, and block them in your calendar. Because, And one other thing I would tell you that I always did is that I really had to stop, you know, people, there's some people who would just work all day, just continue. And you found that you're just answering emails, whether it's nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. And, you know, it was like, I, you'll burn out. You will burn out so quickly. So, you know, you have to kind of set some guardrails for yourself. Okay, I'm going to not work after this time, you know, maybe I'm going to take a break. I'm going to have some dinner. I'm going to relax. I'm going to veg out. Maybe you'll go back to your emails or whatever later, but you really have to kind of set some guardrails and some boundaries for yourself because otherwise the days just blend and they just go on and on and on and on. So you, you, you've got to make sure you, you maintain your own sanity. At least I had to. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, do you find that time is now understood as the most prioritized commodity, making it hard to get time with people? Not any more than usual for, to me. I mean, time was always precious. I don't think, again, for me, I, I don't think it's so different. I think it's always, time is always a precious commodity. So not any more than it was before would be my response. I don't see a huge difference. I'd say this. If you're having trouble getting on someone's calendar, they're probably worth talking to. Like, you know what I mean? You, you kind of want to be dealing with the people who are busy and crushing it right now, right? So if they can't, you know, I think you got to be a little bit weary if you call, you know, if you send them an email and they email you back in one minute and ready to jump on the phone and talk right away. Like, People are busy and, and there's a lot going on. And this is a very busy time either because of transitions or for a lot of industries that are just taking off. Right. So um, I think, I think people being busy is certainly a challenge during this time uh, in terms of getting to people though. I think, you know, uh, I think the people who are busy are worth the wait a little bit and, and, you know, be a little, you know, be comfortable following up. I don't, I don't think people are not, if people don't respond, I think you got to give them a little bit of, of leeway during this time and that it may not be intentional. It just may be a little bit overwhelming right now. Great advice. Always reach out. The worst you can get is a no or a non-response, but the potential that you could get a yes is higher. Um, this is a really great one. So and this kind of touches a bit on a point I think, Justin, you made later earlier as well. Many companies are returning to in-person work or split shifts because everyone has different comfort levels for in-person interaction. Do you have any advice for communicating your boundaries, engaging your coworkers' boundaries in a professional and respectful way? I think this is probably one of the hardest things right now. Because it's, it's just everyone is, everyone's in a different place. And, and when you're under, when you feel like you're under pressure, you're under pressure and it's just grossly uncomfortable. So, I mean, you know, it's easy to say, but I think you've just, you've got to be really clear and direct in advance if possible. So you don't have to like 
be in an uncomfortable situation where, where you're going to try and talk about it after six people already came into the conference room. You know what I mean? Like, I think you've just got to be to whomever your supervisor is. I think you've got to take it upon yourself to let them know how you feel uh, because everyone's situation is different, right? Just because you're 21 and healthy, you know, doesn't mean that you, you don't live with someone who's 95. Like there's just, there are lots of things to consider here and no one is in the same position. And, and frankly, no one should be judging anyone. It, it, this is a very personal decision that, that people need to be able to make for themselves. Great. Thank you, Justin. And I would also add in my role, I sometimes need to go into the office every now and then because a large part of what I do is product development. And I would always lead with assuming someone has the most restrictive boundaries and creating space for them to be able to be comfortable enough to say what their own boundaries are. If you ever propose something and end with, if you're comfortable with that, if not, we can find an alternative. I find that that makes people feel safer to communicate what they need and being that open ear so that there's also solidarity. If someone feels like they're the only one that feels that way, being able to have someone else that can kind of add to that voice definitely helps. So to keep in mind. All right. So we have a few more questions and then we'll wrap. Um, this one I've, and the topic of mentorship. I've heard people say mentees should also be prepared to have something to offer their mentors, i.e. relationships should be symbiotic. What are your thoughts on this mindset? And do you have any examples of how to approach this as a mentee? Um, I, I would, I don't expect anything from my mentees other than uh, I expect you to one day be a mentor when you have gained experience and skills and resources and connections to then bring the next generation up with you. That's it. But I no, I'm good. You don't have to, you don't have to offer me something that's not expected. <laughs> Agreed a hundred percent. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. Good. No, I was just going to say, I agree with Chris. So I have absolutely, I have no expectations that you're bringing something to me, you know, aside from, you know, I hope that you one day too will become a mentor, but I absolutely have no expectations of any of my mentees. So, Am I the business guy where I expect cash for each meeting with my mentee? <laughs> no. Um, I 100% agree, but I'd, I'd add one overlay, which is, don't assume that you can add value to your mentor because I got to say, when I meet with people that are 10 years younger than me, they've got a whole different outlook on life and technology and understanding of social media and marketing in ways that I, I don't grasp, um, you know, and they're able to tell me what's hip and what the cool kids are into these days, you know? I mean, even that's a value add from my perspective. Um, and I think, look, we all went to USC, right? So everyone can make introductions for other people, right? Listen intently and see if you can add some value to your mentor, especially if it's going to be a long-term relationship, but it's certainly not an expectation. Great, great advice. And I would say as someone who's a mentee, um, on the receiving end of some very strong mentorship relationships, one of which is on this webinar right now, Come with a positive attitude and a driven mindset that you want to soak up all the knowledge that someone has to give to you and you want to get to know who they are as a person beyond just what they can do for you or what doors they can open. I find that those have been my best mentorship relationships that have now evolved and there's an aspect of friendship. They care about things beyond just my career and just coming and showing up and being diligent and being responsive because promise that you're probably not busier than they are. That is how you create a good foundation and you can take those best practices to then go and be an amazing mentor. So I'll throw in one last question before we wrap up um, in regards to reaching out, you know, wanting to connect with people without sounding too desperate, but wanting some sort of lead. Can you ask for leads with cold reach out and what's appropriate? So what, help me, I'm just trying to dissect that a bit because I have had um, instances where someone's reached out, can you, 
hey, it looks like they have this job available. Do you know who this, who's the hiring manager? Well, okay. One, I'm not going to do all the research for you and we've never talked. And <laughs> so, you know, when you say a lead, I, I need to understand a little bit more. Now I've had someone who's reached out, Kim, here's an opportunity, blah, 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 this. I think I'd be great for this job. You know, you and I have talked, you know, there's someone I know and then we've, we've talked, you know, that's when I'm more engaged in saying, hey, I know who the hiring manager is, send me a resume, let's talk, let's do, do, do this, and I'll want to help and make those connections. But if you're just kind of trying to hit me up, um, it's probably not going to, I'm just going to be very blunt and honest. If you're just saying, hey, you know, we both went to SC, can you tell me what's going on at the current company that you're at? Do they have some job openings? Like, I, I'm not vested into that. I'm not going to do the research for you. But you know, when, when someone's really do, do has done their due diligence and really are just needing support, I'm more than willing to help, but I, I'm not going to do your work for you, I guess would be the, hopefully it doesn't come off too harsh, but I want to be very honest. I have actually an example of someone who cold reached out to me on LinkedIn and it was very well done. So I'll maybe go over that as an example. So this individual worked in fashion. I didn't know this person. I had no connections to this person. They wrote a very thoughtful note to me via LinkedIn Messenger. They're in fashion. They've been trying to break into tech for years. They have not been successful. They don't have any natural connections into tech themselves. I've seen you've broken from CPG into tech. Do you mind if, you know, spending just a little time or just a response to this email? How did you do that? What, like, I know where I want to get to, but I am having a really hard time getting there. That to me is very actionable. Like, I understand that struggle. I've lived it. You've clearly done your research to find people that fit the profile of what you're trying to make happen to Justin's earlier point of like, if you're trying to point to something very specific that, you know, your potential mentor has clearly experienced, that was very smart of her. So um, long story short, I actually ended up hiring her as a contractor at Airbnb. Now she also took a big risk. She left a full-time job uh, with benefits. She's young though, right? She decided it was worth it for her. What does thousand stock options on the hundred billion dollar company? I mean, look, <laughs> we'll talk about that separately. <laughs> So, I mean, but I told her, right? I told her straight up, honestly, tech is very insular for better or for worse. It's not great, but it is. And so you're going to maybe have to be a little uncomfortable and not get a full-time job. But if you want an in, a great in is to be a contractor. It's super easy to get hired as a contractor. She was willing to take that jump. And now she has a full-time role um, at App Dynamics, which is a tech company. So it's just, again, it's sort of like, she came to me with a very specific problem. She was willing to actually put herself out there and she ended up taking the risk of what I thought would be a good path. And I'm not saying it's always going to work out, but I thought that was a very interesting sort of example of someone who cold called. I know we're running over. I'm going to break it down into three buckets real quick the way I see it. Number one, cold email asking for leads, automatic ignore. Okay. Cold email with a connection like SC where you want to build a relationship and you're going to flatter me a little bit, you'll get a call back. And I think you will from most alum, right? So that's like bucket two is like the long game. I'm actually reaching out, not because I want you to do something for me or I'm asking for a job. It's because I'd like to get to know you. And I believe this networking thing will work part of the Trojan family, right? The third bucket, I think, fits to what Kim, who are, they're on diagonal parts of my screen here, Crystal and, and Kim said, right, which is if there's a connection, hey, USC, I've done my research already and I have a specific ask of you that you can potentially get done before you clear this email out of your inbox and move on to the other 500, right? Like, I know who the hiring manager is and I know what the criteria is, but hey, do you think someone with this this type of background should apply for this job or that job? That's like a specific ask. Kim, I think you would answer that question, right? Because they, they've already done some, some legwork there, right? And or Crystal, listen, I want to be like you. Tell me how to be like you. You take interest in that and, and that elicits a response, right? So to me, those are like the three buckets. And my advice is 
play the long game. Reach out to people now who you don't need right now. <laughs> Reach out to people when you don't need a job, right? Build the network of people who are your friends and colleagues who you can go to for help when you need something. You got to you gotta network long before you need something, in my opinion. I would absolutely agree with that last statement, Justin. I will tell you my next role, um, a huge component of it for me even being able to get into the interview was because of a mentor that I had long before this job was even available. <laughs> so it was a relationship that I had already established and he was able to kind of help propel and ensure that I kind of got in front because there was quite a few people that were applying for this role. So I, the long game is so, because it's, it's an authentic, you know, I wasn't just reaching out just for something because we always had that, that interaction and that engagement. So right. completely agree with you. Amazing. Well, thank you all for the wonderful advice, the insight, the tips, best practices. I know I took a lot away from it and I'm sure that many of our attendees also did as well. So we are going to wrap. Christina, who sent out your intro email, will also follow up um, to allow you to connect with any of our panelists here. Encourage you to go and connect with them on LinkedIn. You just got all the tips on how to do it the right way. But thank you, Crystal, Kim, and Justin for dedicating your time this Friday night and just pouring out wisdom to all of us. Yes, thank you guys so thank much you. for joining us tonight. Crystal, Kim, Justin, we know that it's your Friday night also. So we really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to speak with the young alumni and answer some questions and share your incredible expertise. I know I took a lot away from what you had to say, and I'm looking forward to watching where your careers blossom to in the future um, as well. But thank you guys so much. And we'll look forward to connecting with you, hopefully in person at some point in the future.